All right, we've got a very long chapter here uh, this evening, and I'm actually planning on doing something I don't normally do with the Bi Bible study on Wednesday night. We're probably not going to complete chapter 12 tonight. I'm planning when I get back in uh, two weeks from tonight to finish chapter 12 and then go through chapter 13. So don't worry when you look down at the time and you're like, uh, Pastor Burson, we've got a lot more to go. Uh, on the really long, dense chapters, I, I'm, I may just do this from time to time. That's the nice thing about being a pastor. You can kind of decide what, what you want to do and how I want to preach. Normally, I try to keep everything limited to just getting everything knocked out in one week, but there are exceptions to that rule. And uh, it's actually one of the things that's going to come up this evening is just the concept of having exceptions to rules. Even God's rules have some exceptions. Um, for, the, for the most part, God's word, God's laws, God's commands are very black and white. But there are times we're going to see this evening, I'm going to focus on a couple of areas, or one area in particular in this chapter, where there is some room for exceptions to the law. And we're going to see that this evening. Uh, there's two main topics we're going to cover as we get into this chapter. One being on the Sabbath day. So Matthew 12, more than probably all the other chapters within the book of Matthew, uh, focuses on the Sabbath and how the people wanted to kill Jesus. People who hated Jesus wanted to kill him. The Sabbath is one of the main reasons why people wanted to kill Well. Not one of the main reasons why they wanted to kill him as much as they hated Jesus and it was one of the ways they were trying to use against him, right? Now, the fact that he was healing and doing it just burned people up. The people that hated it just burned them up that he's doing this stuff on the, on the Sabbath and, you know, they're trying to be these really religious people and, you know, they, they wanted to make themselves look so holy and, and how great they were and how observant they were of the Sabbath and stuff and then they've got Jesus coming along and healing people and doing things that, that they thought he shouldn't be doing. And that kind of burned him up in addition to him just, you know, preaching with power and truth and getting, you know, having disciples and people following him and, and people excited and, and having zeal and doing good works for the Lord. You know, the children of the devil hate that. So um, without further ado, let's dig into the chapter. That's, that's one of the, the first things we're going to touch on here. Verse number one, the Bible reads, at that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn and his disciples were in hungered and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, behold, thy disciples do that, which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. So here we got these tattletales Right? These guys that are, that are just meddling and want to get involved in other people's business and say, hey, Jesus, look, your disciples are sinning. Go tell them not to do that, Jesus. Don't you hate those people that just like this want to tell on everybody? You know, don't be the tattletale on, on, you know, when people aren't doing right or whatever, when you think they're not doing right. Look, they, they, weren't, they weren't like, you know, stealing from people or killing people or, you know, they're eating some corn. Okay. And they have to go and bring all this stuff up to Jesus. Now, the reason why they're bringing it up is because it was the Sabbath day and God does have some very strict commands on the Sabbath day. So this is, this is actually a very important subject to understand and to learn because We've already seen up to this point, you know, Jesus is not softening up on God's law at all. He doesn't do that. He's not like toning it down and trying to make things just, well, it's a little bit nicer now. He doesn't do that at all. So when it comes to the Sabbath, he's not doing that with the Sabbath either. But what he's doing with the Sabbath is he's demonstrating and showing people and teaching people and rebuking people how they're wrong about what their concept of the Sabbath is because there's a lot of people that would just didn't understand it at all. So Jesus um, does a lot, but he's, of course, right in everything that he does. So um, he's correcting their, their misunderstanding of the Sabbath. And um, with this event of his disciples eating corn, because what are they doing? They're going around and they're preaching the gospel, right? 
on the Sabbath day, they're, they're traveling while they're ministering to people, while they're preaching. And of course, as you're doing this, you're going to get hungry. They're not, they're, this isn't their normal routine of like, they're going to work six days a week and then they're sitting at, you know, they're spending the Sabbath resting. That's not what the, the, the you know, that's what it is for, for the vast majority of Israel, for the people here, but not for Jesus and his disciples, right? They've got a ministry, they're working, and they're, they're going through and doing the work that they're supposed to be doing. Now, as a result, they pluck this, these corn and, uh, and start to eat it. And just to show you how serious God is, turn back to Exodus chapter 16 because I, I want to try to give you a, a full view just of the Sabbath in general and of God's laws and, and especially this one of how God, God is very serious about the Sabbath. This, this isn't a flippant thing of just, oh yeah, well, you know, just take it easy and relax on the Sabbath. That's not, you know, that's the way that people who want to observe the Sabbath today kind of think of it. It's just like, well, you know, just kind of a fun day and we'll just, you know, and look, if you want to do that, it's fine. But don't think that you're like observing the Sabbath the way that God spelled it out in the Bible to observe the Sabbath by just kind of having a fun day. Because there is a lot that goes into making sure you're not, you're not working at all, like not even a little bit and not having anybody work for you either. That's what like the Bible says, not your men servants, your maid servants, your ox, your ass, like, like nobody's supposed to be working on the Sabbath day. It's not like, well, I'm going to go out to eat because I'm not working, but well, you're putting other people to work. Those are servants. I mean, you, you might not think about it that way, but why do you think the, the server is called a server that comes to your table and takes your order and then brings you food? They're serving you. So you're causing someone else to eat or to, to work, excuse me, when you go out to eat. They're working for you. So if you were really going to be observing the Sabbath, you can't go out to eat like that. You'd have to have all of your food already prepared, ready to go. It's not a sin to eat on the Sabbath. Obviously, you've got to eat. The disciples were eating. And then what were they doing? They're plucking corn. Like, like they're not preparing some big fancy meal. and doing all, like, They plucked an ear of corn literally as they were walking by to, to eat. Right? This is what, and this is why they're being accused of breaking the Sabbath. But before I even get into all of those details, let's look at Exodus chapter 16 because this is a very serious commandment. Although it's one of the Ten Commandments to keep the Sabbath day. And um, I'm not going to get into all the meanings with the, with the creation and everything else, but um, let's look at verse number 22 of Exodus 16. The Bible says, And it came to pass that on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. So what this is referring to is when God started giving manna to the children of Israel in the, in the wilderness. Okay, when God provided the food for them miraculously in the wilderness and God made it so that there was manna on the ground that they had to go and collect in the morning and then uh, were able to eat for that day. And every, he, he gave them enough food sufficient for the day, for that day. And then we're going to see here how he gives them twice as much food then to collect on Friday, right? The day before the Sabbath. I'm, I'm just using common terms. Forgive me for that. The way that we understand things, Saturday is a Sabbath day. It's a seventh day. So I'm talking in terms of our calendar. On the Friday, they would end up going out and be able to collect enough food for two days because they can't go out and even do that level of work of going out and collecting the food to prepare it and then be able to eat it on that day. God didn't even want them doing that much work. And one of the cool things about the manna is that there's no other day that they were able to do that. If they went in and collected enough food for two days, if they, if they kept it overnight, it would breed worms and it would stink and it would rot and you wouldn't be able to do it. So talk about a miracle. God is only on that one proper day that that didn't happen. Every other day of the week, it would have, it would have gone bad. So um, lots of symbolism there. We're not going to get into all the manna stuff, but let's keep reading here in verse, uh, verse number 23 of Exodus 16. The Bible says, And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye will bake today, and seethe that ye will seethe, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. And they laid it up till the morning, as Moses bade, 
and it did not stink, neither was there any worm therein. And Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today ye shall not find it in the field. So he's saying, prepare it, do everything, however you want to, you want to bake it, you want to boil it, you want to, you know, however you want to prepare it and cook it and make it ready for you to eat. Do all of that work. Because let's face it, when you're preparing a meal like that, that is work. I mean, ask any, any housewife that, that prepares meals for the home, it's work. All right, there's, there's work that goes into that, or anybody for that matter. I mean, anyone who's, who's preparing a meal, you know that that's work. And... Um, He's telling them to do that work before the Sabbath because the Sabbath is a day of rest. Verse number 26 says, uh, Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. And it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day for to gather, and they found none. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath, Therefore he giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide ye every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Now the reason why I even brought this passage up is because they're preparing food. And God's telling them, look, I don't even want you prepare. The food's not going to be out there. I don't want you going out to gather it. And I don't want you preparing it and doing all this work. I want you just to rest. So we do have an example here of people gathering food that God doesn't want them to do. Now, were the disciples just like gathering food to prepare it? Not quite, no. But we're going to get to that too in a minute. I, again, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but that's the reason. We're going to look at one more story here in Numbers chapter 15 to emphasize how serious God is about the commandment of the Sabbath day and keeping it because it's actually the death penalty for breaking the Sabbath. Like that, that, that alone is huge. That, that should be like, whoa, okay, we really need to make sure we're doing things right when it comes to the Sabbath. If it's just like, man, you screw up, you're going to be put to death essentially for, for disobeying the commandment of the Lord. So you, if you're going to err on any side, you want to, you want to use caution and, you know, and, and, and err on the side of not doing anything when it comes to the Sabbath, I think in general it would have been a good rule to, to be following for yourself. Verse number uh, 32 of Numbers chapter 15 says, And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. So this guy's going out collecting firewood or whatever. He's gathering these sticks. Not necessarily a huge job, but he's still working. It says, And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation, and they put him in ward because it was not declared what should be done to him. So basically what it says, they put him in ward. It's kind of like just, just keeping hold of him. They, they're putting him like in jail, right? They, they, they kind of lock him up and say, well, we don't know what to do with this guy. Now they knew he was working. They caught him. They're like, we need to find out what needs to be done with this. So they, they, they lay, lay hold on him. Verse number 35 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones, and he died as the Lord commanded Moses. So pretty serious. God's serious about, about the keeping the Sabbath day and keeping it holy and nobody doing any work. Now, I brought this up in the past, how the Sabbath is a picture of, of the rest that we have in Christ, and we're going to get to that a uh, little bit in a little bit. But before we even get to that, I'm going to continue reading in Matthew chapter 12. And that's, uh, the reason why I bring it up now is because that just shows how important, you know, when God's talking about something serious like not working for your salvation, the consequence is death. If you think you could add any, any little bit, as little bit of gathering sticks of works to your rest, then your punishment is hell. It's death. I mean, that's, that's the way it is. And that's why God is so strict on this thing because it's symbolic of salvation, of Jesus Christ being our rest. And you have to rest completely in Him. And you can't even think about adding anything that you can possibly do to that rest. Because otherwise it's death. So that's, the, that's kind of the purpose for, for that commandment. 
Uh, it's, it's unique. It's not, it's not like most of the other ones when it comes to um, death penalty and things like that. So um, let's keep reading here. Now, they just came to Jesus in Matthew 12 and said, hey, your disciples are, are breaking the Sabbath, essentially what they're saying. What, you know, they shouldn't be doing that. So Jesus responds to them in verse number three, but he said unto them, have you not read what David did when he was in hunger and they that were with him? How he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. So Jesus is rebuking them now by bringing up this story about what David did. And if you want to, you could turn to 1 Samuel 21. We'll just read real briefly what actually happened in that story. So this is after, you know, David knew that Saul had it out for him and Saul wanted to kill him. And Jonathan was trying to convince him, going, no, you know, like, he's not really going to kill you. He says, but, you know, we'll do this. And they, and they had this whole plan and, and David was gone. And he said, well, just tell him I had to go do something with my family. Tell him I had, I had this feast to go to and I just had to go when Saul asks why I'm not at the dinner table, right? So that's what they do. Saul freaks out eventually, you know, like after a couple days, you know, Saul's going nuts and Jonathan finally realizes, yeah, he, he does want to kill you. Like, you're right. So... David and, and, and Jonathan are splitting up. David's going to go out now and kind of be on the run a little bit and just go off into hiding and just get away from Saul so Saul doesn't kill him. And because he leaves rather quickly, you know, him and, and, his, and his guys, you know, him and his, his mighty men are, going, are traveling with them. Uh, they leave kind of quickly. So they don't have time to like pack their bags and get all this food and get a bunch of supplies and they don't want to draw a lot of attention to themselves either. David's just trying to get out of there because <laughs> Saul wants to kill him. So they take off and they go to, um, to the priest here and in 1 Samuel 21, you know, David's basically asking for some food because they've been traveling and now he's, you know, they're, they're about to, to go into hiding and he, and he wants to, he need, they need to eat. They didn't have time to really fully prepare for it. So in verse number three, the Bible says, Now therefore, what is under thine hand? Give me five loaves of bread in mine hand, or what, is, what there is present. And the priest answered David and said, There is no common bread under mine hand, but there is hallowed bread, if the young men have kept themselves at least from women. So when he asked the priest for the food, the priest responds and says, we, There is no common bread. There's no bread that just like anybody can eat. But there is hallowed bread. It's, it's, it's sanctified. It's set apart. It was actually used in the service, you know, before the Lord as something that's holy. And that holy food, that, whether it be, you know, the sacrifice or this bread, that's like this, these offerings that were for the Lord, was only supposed to be eaten by the priests or by the Levites, depending on what it was, right? It's only those people were allowed to even partake of that food, of that holy food that was given in sacrifice to the Lord. Now, what he had was the showbread. Now, the showbread isn't mentioned a whole lot in the Bible, but basically they had this table set up in the outer sanctuary where um, it just had this bread continually before the Lord, just kind of on display, right? And this was something that was just supposed to always be before the Lord, just have that bread there. And there's so much symbolism even in this one story about just Jesus Christ, I mean, think about it. Jesus Christ is the bread of God. He's the bread of life. So you got this bread continually there in the sanctuary. What does David need? You know, David and his men are hungry. They need something to sustain them. So they're asking for some bread. And then, I mean, think about the, um, the correlation even between observing the death of our Lord through, the, through taking of the bread and the drinking of the wine and how the Bible says to let everyone examine himself, they might be worthy. And the Bible saying here that, well, there's no common bread, we have this hallowed bread. Well, as long as the men have kept themselves at least from women, right? Like there's a certain level of, you know, they're not just, just kind of sinning and in, in, in this level of sin where he's saying, you, you know what? No, if they're you know, if you guys have been, you know, if the, if the guys have been fornicating or whatever, like, I'm not going to give you this bread. This is hallowed bread. So there's a level of standard here where he's saying, 
you know, this is holy bread. But here's the difference with it, though, because David answers him and says, verse 5, says, David answered the priest and said unto him, of a truth, women have been kept from us about these three days since I came out, and the vessels of the young men are holy. So he's talking about their bodies, their vessels. He says, they're holy. They, they, they haven't been, you know, they haven't been doing anything. And the bread is in a manner common, yea, though it were sanctified this day in the vessel. So he's saying, it is still kind of common. And the reason why is because what they would do is they would swap the bread out. So they would continually every day be putting new show bread out that was going to be on the table before the Lord. So this was some of the bread that was taken, removed from being before the Lord and new bread was placed out there. So they had this bread that, yeah, it was still only lawful for the priests to eat, but it's not like they took it directly from just before the Lord, right? The Lord's showbread didn't leave from being before the Lord. It's not like they did that, but it was still sanctified bread. It was still, you know, holy bread, if you, if you will. And it says here, um, verse number six, so the priest gave him hallowed bread, for there was no bread there but the showbread that was taken from before the Lord to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away. So he's saying they swapped out the bread and that's what was given to them then was this this other bread uh, that was the showbread. Now, Jesus is using this example to demonstrate why it was okay for his disciples to eat the corn that they were eating. Because later on he says, well, you wouldn't have condemned the guiltless. Meaning that his disciples were not guilty of anything when they ate that corn. And he's basically using this example of David saying, David wasn't guilty of anything either. Even though God's law would say, hey, this is only for the priest. Now, why is that? And I'm not going to get into all the different, there's, a, there's actually a few times in the Bible where you can see things where God is allowing for mercy and exceptions to the rule in more extreme situations. So when you have a situation where, you know, these guys need to eat, we don't know exactly how long they've been traveling for and, and you know, they're on the run and it's in a situation and, and they're without food in order to, to survive, basically, God's allowing for this type of situation to, okay, this will be acceptable under these conditions. But that's not the norm. That's not the standard. That's not the law. It's like, look, this is for the priest, but okay, Here's an event where that can happen. And we're going to see the same thing with the Sabbath day, that as serious as God was saying, you know what, you can't gather sticks on the Sabbath day. It's that serious not to do work, but when you've got somebody left in a ditch, when you've got someone that needs to be healed, when you've got people that are in these situations, all of a sudden, oh yeah, that's okay, that's acceptable to help people, to do good, to, 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 you know, not allow people to die, okay, that, that was fine because God's not setting the rule of having the Sabbath day to be, you know, some detriment to, to man, to kind of just be, be more harmful than good, it just in order to keep that and to follow that, That's, that doesn't make any sense. And that's why it's really important to understand the spirit of the law as well as the letter of the law. Both are important because God is very serious on when he lays things out and we ought to respect that. But at the same time, there are conditions in which God will show mercy and allow for things to happen that, that is not going to make you guilty. Now, I, I say this very carefully because you can't take something like this and run with it and start applying this to every sin that you have in your life going, well, God's going to be merciful. God understands. And this, you know, we're talking like life and death situations here. Okay. Don't start abusing the principle that I'm trying to teach into just whatever you want. Another situation that comes to mind is when, like, when, when Rahab the harlot lied, right? When you bear false witness, that's it's against God's law. And, and it's very black and white. Hey, thou shalt not bear false witness. But what was she doing? She was saving the lives of the, of the spies that were sent out 
to spy out the land so that because uh, they're going to come in and, and obviously bring judgment upon the city and, and do the will of the Lord. I mean, they were there, again, working for God. They were doing something that God wanted them to do, and they were being protected. Yes, it happened through a lie, but basically God is, is um, blessing Rahab for protecting them. And that's not looked on as, as being something that's sinful. Even though... Yeah, n under any normal circumstance, you don't do that. It's against the law. It's against God's law. These are exceptions, but of course, they're only exceptions. And you know, the exception proves the rule. rule. Otherwise, you wouldn't even have the rule, right? If it was just no big deal. But these are known as exceptions for that very reason. Let's, um, let's keep going here in Matthew chapter 12, because he brings up another example in verse number five. He says, or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless. And you say, what does he mean by that, Pastor Rubens? Well, the priests are taking care of the sacrifices and the work of the house of the Lord every day of the week. Every day, there needs to be that showbread put out. Every day, there needs to be the candle lit. Every day, there needs to be, you know, like all these various things that just services that need to be done in the house of the Lord. How about the daily sacrifice? Like every day, these things need to be done. And when the priests are doing that, they're working. Now, the Bible says you shall do no work. But they're working. But of course... They're doing exactly what God would have them to do by working. So when you are doing exactly what God would have you to do in that work, that's not what God was talking about when you can't work on the Sabbath day. Right? It's, it's, it's not a complicated you know, subject to understand, but we have to, be, we have to be very careful in how we understand the Bible. And this isn't Pastor Burson's going soft on God's law either. This is just understanding what God's word is saying and what it's actually teaching. I like being very zealous about God's law and trying to, as much as possible, have the high standards and keep the law to the letter as much as we possibly can. But at the same time, we don't want to get so overboard that we start condemning people that are not even in the wrong because we've gone too close to the letter of the law and completely forgotten the spirit of the law. Amen. And that was what was happening here. These guys are just, they're so caught up and hung up on the letter of the law that they don't realize, look, Jesus and his disciples are going around and healing people. They're saving souls from hell. They're teaching the word of God, which are all things that are completely fine on the Sabbath day. And as they're walking by, decide to eat some food, which required no work anyways. I mean, you, you grab a piece of corn off a stalk and, and the most work is peeling back the, the husk. And that's what they want to judge them for and condemn the guiltless. So, on this same topic, you know, Jesus, Jesus broke the Sabbath day in this regard. The same way that the priests break the Sabbath day. Now, Jesus didn't sin just as much as the priest didn't sin. So, they're not sinning even though they're breaking the Sabbath. So, why are you saying, why are you saying that you, they broke the Sabbath? Because they worked. Because they're working. Because the Sabbath day says not to work. They are working. Jesus Christ said in John chapter 5, you can turn if you want, John chapter 5, he says, um, my father worketh hitherto and I work. So he is not, I mean, undoubtedly saying, I'm working. When the Sabbath day says not to work. So that is breaking the Sabbath. However, it is not sinfully breaking the Sabbath because that would be an exception to the rule of what's allowed just like the priests offering the sacrifices that God's commanded them to do is not breaking, is not, is not sinful, sinfully breaking the Sabbath. Just like uh, performing circumcision, right? If circumcision has to be the eighth day after a child's born, after a son's born, 
Well, what, you know, every once in a while, you're going to have one out of seven chances that eighth day is going to be a Saturday. And then you're stuck going, well, what do we do? Do we not work and not circumcise a child and, and, and you know, obey the Sabbath of not working, but then disobey the circumcision on the eighth day? Or do we obey the circumcision on the eighth day and disobey the, the Sabbath, right? And, G and the Bible is very clear that you can keep from sinning by doing the circumcision on the eighth day as you're supposed to do because you're doing what's right. There is no law against doing right. That's right. That, would be, that would be a contradiction in God's word. If God's telling you to do right and then you're still sinning, yeah, right. that doesn't make any sense. Right. John chapter, excuse me, I think, I, did I say John chapter 6? I meant John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse number 16, the Bible says, uh, And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. So again, you see, and you see a lot of that in the, in the book of John. We don't see as much in the book of Matthew. Uh, but the, I mean, the people were just going nuts because he was healing and doing these things on the Sabbath day. And then verse 17 it says, But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him because he not only had uh, broken the Sabbath, which he did break the Sabbath by working, like I said, but he was not guilty of sin. He was without sin. He was doing everything right. Um, he had not only broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. And you know what? They were right on both of those. Now, they weren't right to be mad at him, but he did break the Sabbath, and he was equal with God because he was God. But that made them mad <laughs> instead of glad that, that Jesus is doing all these great miracles and he's the son of God come to redeem the world, Right? So they were, they were mad for all the wrong reasons, but they actually got the, those two points correct. Um, so let's see here. In, uh, in Matthew 12, the Bible says, verse number 6, But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. Because he was just talking about the, you know, the priests, the um, priests, in the temple profaning the Sabbath, the Sabbath, but they're blameless. He says, By saying you did that in this place was one greater than the temple, but if you had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, ye would not have condemned the guiltless. And this is showing to God's mercy. God cares more about that, you know, extending the mercy for doing the right things. You condemn the guiltless. If you understood the, if you understood God and you understood the mercy of God, you wouldn't have condemned the guiltless. Um, just showing without a doubt they were not guilty of anything in what they did. They were completely guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Now, some people take that verse 8 and will say the only reason why Jesus was not sinning is because he's God, so he's able to do whatever he wants. I don't believe that, that that's what this is just referring to from this verse because he was talking about, they, who were they condemning? They weren't condemning Jesus. They were condemning his disciples. And he says, they were guiltless. You wouldn't have condemned the guiltless. So it's not even, it wasn't even referring to himself. He was referring to them. Now, this also isn't just him um, just because, because some people say, well, Jesus just has the power of forgiving anybody for anything whenever he wants to. And um, I don't think this is just that either because, again, they wouldn't need to be forgiven if, they're, if they didn't have guilt. So just say he already said that they're guiltless. Um, and I think with all the examples, he's already demonstrated that. Uh, but, but, it, but, of course, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And, and um, that stands. Look at where oh, I'm going to read for you from Mark chapter 2. Because this is the same story is brought up in Mark chapter 2, verse 27. The Bible says, And he said, un, he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. And that gives us a little bit more insight to that statement of Jesus Christ saying the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Because that, that phrase before that wasn't recorded in Matthew as it was in the book of Mark. 
So in Mark 2, 27, I'll read it again. He says, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Don't put the cart before the horse. He's saying the point of the Sabbath was for man, was for you to understand and to get this through your head that Jesus is your rest and to be able to rest and, and, to, and to grasp. His Look, the Sabbath was made for you. You weren't made just to make sure that you're not, you know, doing anything at all on the Sabbath day. It's not, that's not the point. There's actually a point to the Sabbath and it's for your own benefit. So when you can get that, when you understand that, then you'll realize that um, these guys are guiltless. But let's keep reading here in Matthew 12. Look at verse number 9. The Bible says, And when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man which had his hand withered. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? So here we see this you know, these people, they just want to accuse Jesus Christ. They're trying to trap him. They're trying to trick him. And one of the methods they use to do that is, is trying to um, convict him of, of breaking the Sabbath. And they're tempting him and they're, and they're asking him this question, saying, well, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Because they don't think it is. They think you can't heal at all. But the, Jesus is going to demonstrate again that, he's, that these are just a bunch of hypocrites anyways. They're just trying to find any fault with them that they can. Look what he says in verse number 11. And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? He said, which one of you, you know, I'm going to rephrase this. Which one of you stinking hypocrites, when it's your animal, when it's something that you own, when it's your possession, you know, your sheep, your ox is falling into a pit, and if you don't go and help it and get out there, the thing's going to die or get eaten by a, you know, by a predator or whatever. You know full and well you're going to go down there and help it out and do that work because you'll justify it saying, well, I, you know, I have to do this. Of course everyone's going to do that. And he says, how much then is a man better than a sheep? And I don't think even Jesus is condemning them for, for doing that. But he's saying, you know you all would do that. How much is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. So when you're doing well, that is completely lawful. You're not guilty. When you do well, you're not guilty of any sin. Even if doing well means you're working on the Sabbath day. That trumps the order of importance. Doing well. Doing what God has for you to do. Is, um, is above that. So, and then, of course, he heals him. He says in verse number 13, Then saith he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him how they might destroy him. This happens repeatedly throughout the Gospels. You read, you know, they're always trying to catch him on the Sabbath day, and Jesus is just putting it right in their face and going, Oh, is it lawful to heal? I don't know. Here, stretch out your hand. And he's just healing people left and right. Just... Well, that wasn't, that wasn't very um, tactful, right? What are you trying to do, Jesus? Push these people away? These are bad people. Amen. Yeah. He's not trying to convince them of anything. He's actually just trying to shove it in their face and say, yeah, I am going to heal. Right. Because you guys are just completely wrong and I'm not going to take it lightly on you. I'm going to shove it right in your face that yes, it is lawful to heal. Luke chapter 13, we see another example of this. It says in verse number 14, turn if you would to Colossians chapter number 2. Luke 13 verse 14, the Bible says, And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work, in them therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall, and lead him away to watering? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound all these 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? He's saying, you're going to feed a stinking ant, bring an animal to water. An animal! Right. And this woman has been bound for years, for over a decade. And you're saying, just because it's a Sabbath, she shouldn't be healed? What's the matter with you people? 
And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and rightfully so. And all the people rejoiced for the glorious things that were done by him. Yeah, they ought to be ashamed. And you know what? Sometimes in preaching, you ought to preach in a way that people ought to be ashamed of themselves when they've when they're got a wicked heart, when they're guilty of wicked things. And they're so focused on, on you know, on, in this case, just on the law that they just completely forget about people altogether and, and doing what's right. They just want to condemn. Colossians chapter 2. The reason why we're going to Colossians chapter 2 is as, as important as the Sabbath day is and has been in history and how seriously God has taken it, but it's okay to do right on the Sabbath days all throughout the Old Testament. That's always a way. Of, it's not just with Jesus that it was all right to do good on, on the Sabbath day. It always has been. Just like it's always been okay for the priests to, to perform their work on the Sabbath day. But in the New Testament, we don't have to observe the Sabbath day anymore. Sunday is not our Sabbath. Saturday is the Sabbath, but we don't have to observe it. Now, if you choose to take a day to devote to going to church and spending time with your family and not working, great. God bless you. I think that's a good idea to be able to have a day to relax. Nothing wrong with that at all. But don't Judaize the New Testament into trying to bring back the things which have been done away. The areas that Jesus has fulfilled. Just as much as we're not bringing back lamb sacrifices, we're not bringing back this observance of the Sabbath day either. Colossians chapter 2, look at verse number 13. The Bible says, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore, that therefore... What's that referring to? What we just talked about. Jesus Christ paying for all of our sins. Amen. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon, look at this, or of the Sabbath days, Amen. which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. All of those things, it says, are a shadow of what's to come. It's foreshadowing. Here's what's going to happen. The Sabbath, what's that a foreshadowing of? Jesus Christ rest. The rest in Christ. The work that he did for us while we rest in him. That's the foreshadowing. So he says, let no man judge you therefore in these things. If we're not going to let any man judge us, judge us for what? For not keeping the Sabbath day? What else is there? I mean, I mean, what else can you possibly be judged for on the Sabbath day? It's a real simple command. It's just you don't do any work. What else can you be judged for? Nothing. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4. We'll see one more, one more uh, evidence for this. I've got to hurry up because there's another really important point and I'm starting to run short on time. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 3. We'll go through this real quickly. The Bible says, For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. So what's he talking about? Verse number three, he's talking about rest. Verse number four, he's talking about the seventh day. That's the Sabbath. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. So notice the correlation he's bringing in there that if they shall enter into my rest, he's talking about, um, he brings up the Sabbath day. It says in verse number six, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. He's going to explain some more, but he, he's just trying to spell this out and break it down real simple. He's saying, there's still some people that need to enter into rest. You're saying, if they shall enter into my rest. And the people who didn't enter into God's rest, it's because they didn't believe. Well, therefore, when you believe, that's entering into 
God's rest. I mean, this is, this is what he's deducing here, but let's keep reading here. Verse number seven, again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. The people who are entered into the rest of Jesus Christ, they've stopped working. So the reason why he's tying this together with the creation is that God worked on day one. God worked on day two. God worked on day three. God worked on day four, five, six. And then he completely rests on day seven. He didn't do anything. We want to enter into God's rest well, just as God stopped working and then rested, we need to stop working for our salvation and thinking that that's going to save us and enter into the rest of Jesus by saying, no more works. I'm going to rest with God and, and not do works to, to, get to save my soul. He says in verse number 11, then let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. He's saying, once you believe, hey, you are entered into that rest, now let's labor, because we're already into that, let's labor to enter into that rest, lest any man, you know, basically, lest any other man fall after the same example of unbelief. You already have that rest. Let's make sure other people can get that rest. So, so for us, it's work. For the person who's getting saved, there's no work involved there. But for the person who's bringing salvation, there's work involved. So yes, there is work involved in salvation. It's not your work. It's the work of Jesus and the work of other people then that'll bring that to you. The laborer that goes and preaches the gospel, they need to do work. But the person receiving the gospel do no, does none. So as, as many of us as have entered in that rest, let's go labor so that no one else falls after the example of unbelief. So that there's not other unbelievers that are going to hell because they're not rested from their works. Does that make sense? All right. Let's keep going in Matthew chapter 12. That was the first main point that I wanted to get across. And there's one other one that I really want to get to that we are going to get to. Uh, let's let's kind of go quickly here. Matthew chapter 12, verse 14. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him how they might destroy him. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence and great multitudes followed him and he healed them all and charged them that they should not make him known that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying, behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry. Neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break and smoking flax shall he not quench till he send forth judgment unto victory. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. This is um, referring to Isaiah 42. I'm not going to turn there. I, I, I have it in my notes. But if you want to look it up later, you can look up Isaiah 42. That's the reference for this. But what's one of the things that's really cool about this is that he's referencing, uh, it says, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. So it's already prophesied that Jesus Christ is going to be the Savior of the whole world, not just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles also. And that's coming all the way back from Isaiah this should be no big surprise. But what was one of the things that got the Jews all mad and up in arms is when people would teach to the Gentiles, right? You look in the book of Acts and that just made the Jews just nuts that they were going and, and preaching the gospel unto the Gentiles. And the Gentiles were receiving it and that just got them even more mad. But I thought they believed the Old Testament. They didn't believe Isaiah. Also in Matthew 12 there, verse 19, the Bible talks about Jesus Christ here. He says in verse 18, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved. This is Jesus. That's the, that's the prophecy of Jesus Christ. In whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive. Who is this? Jesus. He's not going to be fighting. 
It says, nor cry, meaning crying, like yelling out. Neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. Does it sound like Jesus was a street preacher yelling at people? Repent! <laughs> Repent! The end of the world has come! And just yelling at people as they, as, they, as they walk down the street? No. Now, did Jesus preach? Sure he did. Did Jesus preach to crowds on a mountain and at the ocean and in houses? Sure he did. But was he just walking up and down the streets just, just yelling at people and telling people what, what great sinners they are? No, he wasn't. No. And this is one of the reasons why we don't have a street preaching ministry where you just go out and yell at people about how wicked and sinful they are because that doesn't do any good and we're going to follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. But let's keep reading here. Matthew 20, uh, verse number 22, Matthew 12. Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And when the Bible says dumb, uh, just in case you don't know, it's not talking about like stupid. Dumb just means you can't speak. So when he's healing someone who's dumb, then he's allowing them to be able to speak. And uh, of course, blind, you can't see. It says verse number 23, and all the people were amazed and said, is not this the son of David? And when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. So when they said, is not this the son of David, they're talking about the prophecy. They're talking about the scripture, basically saying like, isn't this Christ? Because they knew that Christ was going to be of the house and lineage of David. So that's why they're saying, isn't this this? I mean, look at what he's doing. Look at the miracles he's doing. Isn't, isn't this who we're waiting for? Isn't this the son of David? And of course, that angers the Pharisees too. Like, oh, you think this guy who's healing all these people and doing all these miracles is, is, is the Messiah? He says, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And this is the last point I want to get into before, just definitely make sure I get into before we're done tonight. Um, they're claiming that the only way Jesus is able to exercise these devils, right, get them, cast them out, is because he's working for Satan, basically. And that the only reason he has power is that they're listening to him because he's able to command them to do whatever because he's just working for Satan. And Jesus explains why that's stupid in verse 25. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. He's saying, you know, these devils want to hurt and to harm people. And if I have authority over them, you know, basically, if, if that's the goal, because that is the goal of Satan and these devils, why would he be fighting against the people that are supposed to be on his side by casting them out from doing what they do? He said, that doesn't make any sense. Like, that's not going to stay. That's not going to work. You can't have infighting of people, one, per, you know, one guy driving out the devils and, you know, the devils wanting to be going back in and, and causing, wreaking havoc and doing damage. He said, that's not going to, that's stupid. To even make such a claim. He says in uh, verse 26, and if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? They're saying, oh, really? So you, think, so you think it's Satan's power that I'm able to cast out? Well, what about your children? Oh, uh, uh, no, that's God. Hypocrites. He says, therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. And he, and he puts them in his corner just like, look. And, and this, is, you know, this is the way that it, that it has to be. And this is why I think the Jews, by and large, are so wicked, is because... If you're a Jew, you either have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, is the Son of God, or you just have to believe that he is like Satan himself, that he is completely of the devil, because everything that he's doing and claiming to be and all that he's done is, um, if he's not who he said he was, if he was just an imposter, would be extremely wicked. And that's why... They take, that's why the Talmud says what it says about our Lord. That's why they had, that's why they're so hardened and just so bitter against Christianity, against Jesus Christ, is because he's viewed as just, as the Antichrist. That's how they view Jesus Christ. And that's what their religion teaches. And that's what you, if, if you can't accept Christ, 
that's really what everybody should believe if you're not going to you know, believe what he said about himself and believe who he was because he's not claiming to just be some normal person. He's claiming to be a son of God, making himself equal with God. We already saw that in the book of John. That's who he's claiming to be. He's not your average person. So it's either true or he's a liar. If he's a liar, what a, what a liar. He says, but hey, if I'm doing this by the Spirit of God, you better pay attention because now the kingdom of God's upon you. Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house? He that is not with me is against me and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. And, you know, what he's done to this point before chapter, verse 30, he's basically saying, you know, you're either fighting on the same team or you're not, right? I mean, he, how could he be working for the devil if he's fighting against the devil? That makes no sense. Then he says, if you're not with me, you're against me. And, and, you know, take note of that too. We need to be all on board with Jesus so that we're not fighting against Jesus. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. You're either doing good or you're doing evil. There is no middle ground. By not doing anything, you're scattering. Because if you're not actively gathering, God says you're scattering. Verse number 31, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. And this is the last concept I want to make sure that we're going to cover tonight, and we're going to go a little bit over, but this is extremely important. This, this concept... This is a great passage. Take note of Matthew chapter 12 when you want to try to explain a reprobate doctrine to somebody. Don't start with Romans 1 and the homos and anything like that. If you want to explain to somebody just the concept that for some people it's too late, that, that there is no hope, that there is no forgiveness, that there are people that could be alive on the earth that just have zero hope of being saved, Show them Matthew chapter 12 as one reason why that, that, that it's even possible. Before you start getting into all the different ways and reasons and, and how that can happen, there is no doubt in Matthew chapter 12 of what he's saying here. Because he's saying, on the one hand, look, if you blaspheme Jesus Christ, you can still be forgiven of that. That's what he's saying. So when people use the name of the Lord in vain, when people blaspheme, say something blasphemous about Jesus, he's saying even that isn't pushing it too far, but when you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, that's when you've gone too far. Now, the Holy Ghost is, is who was giving Jesus the power to do all the works that he was doing. He was, Jesus was casting people out through the power of the Holy Ghost. Jesus was performing all the miracles through the power of the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost was working through Jesus Christ to do all these things. So when they are ascribing the Holy Ghost by blaspheming the power of the Holy Ghost as being Satan and Satanic, he's saying, you don't have forgiveness for that. There is a sin that has no forgiveness. And it's found in Matthew chapter 12. And not only, he makes it clear, because we see all throughout Scripture that there are, there is a, a temporal forgiveness, right, of like, of, of, of things in this lifetime. Like those who are already saved when you sin and, and you're not in good standing with God and, you know, God's going to chastise you and punish you. You can still receive forgiveness even though your soul is already saved from hell. You have eternal forgiveness, but this, this temporal forgiveness... He makes it very clear he's not talking about the short-term forgiveness of, of just kind of being right with God in the moment. He's saying, he says, verse number 32, And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. 
neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So he's saying, you don't have forgiveness in this world, and you don't have forgiveness in the world to come. If you don't have forgiveness in the world to come, your soul's going to hell. So that means if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you never have forgiveness. There is no forgiveness. But there are people that have blasphemed the Holy Ghost, and they have no for it's impossible to be forgiven. They have no forgiveness. You, you, you'd have to really, I don't know what you'd have to do to try to make this say something else. So to, to show somebody that it is possible, because people have been brainwashed into thinking that it's never too late. It's never, until you breathe your last breath, it's not too late to believe in Jesus. Yes, it is. If you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you never have forgiveness. Now, what we're going to see in the next, turn over to Matthew chapter 13. So we're going to cover part of Matthew 13, so we're not going to cover this next week. Because Matthew 12 and 13 both go over the same, the same concept. Look at verse number 10. Because someone might say, well, wait a minute. What if someone blasphemes the Holy Ghost, but then they believe on Jesus? Right? That would be a dilemma. Because you say, well, well, how could he never have forgiveness? But if you believe in Jesus, you have forgiveness, right? You have a contradiction there. So, so what happens? How do, how do you deal with that? Well, we're going to see here in Matthew chapter 13 that they can't believe in Jesus. That's no longer possible. Because if they were, anyone who puts their trust in Jesus, everybody who puts their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior, they believe on him with all their heart, they're saved, and all of their sins are forgiven. That's a fact. But if someone blasphemes the Holy Ghost, they never have forgiveness. The only way that both can be true is that you can't have crossover, which means you can't have someone who's already saved blaspheme the Holy Ghost, which that's kind of easy to see because once you're saved, you have the Holy Ghost residing inside of you. The Bible says that the Spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. So it's part of us. Believers, you, you, you're not going to, you're just not going to say that the Holy Ghost is of the devil and blaspheme the Holy Ghost which resides in you. Even walking in the flesh, like, like that's, there's just some things you're just not going to do. And that's one of them. Because if you did, then you'd never have forgiveness, but you already have forgiveness. I mean, it's just, you can't have both. It is impossible. It's impossible. The harder part, I think, but see, that's an easier part to grasp, the harder part, because anyone who's saved is like, yeah, I'm, I mean, you're not going to blaspheme the Holy Ghost, right? But, I mean, even when you're real worldly and sinful and everything else, I can think back after I was saved and just, just completely living in sin, it never would have, it would never even cross my mind to blaspheme the Holy Ghost or God, like, you're a child of God. It's not going to happen. But the harder part, I think, is people thinking, like, well, that person, I mean, they can't believe Look at Matthew 13, look at verse number 10. The Bible says, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? What a great question. Why, why is it, Jesus? Like, why are you using these things? This is the reason why Jesus is speaking in parables. He's going to answer them and tell them exactly why. Because what's a parable? A parable is just a story. Right? Sometimes we use illustrations and examples to get a, true, a greater truth across. But when Jesus is telling parables unto these people, it's like he's using dark sayings because he's not giving them the full understanding, explanation of what he's really talking about. He's just giving them a story. Right? So, and, and we're going to see this next week. A sower went forth to sow, you know, and he's sowing some seed here. And, so, and they're just like, what are you talking about? Right? If, if that's all you heard, do you really think you're going to have the, the discernment to just be able to just... Be like, oh yeah, well, that's easy what that's talking about. That's talking about this guy receiving the word of God and that guy not, you know, like, you won't come across with that understanding just hearing the parable without the explanation. I mean, his disciples couldn't. They're like, well, what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> right? And then he explains it to them. But, he but, but then they asked him, so like, why are you speaking in parables? Like, why don't you just 
just say it. Just come out and, and teach and, and not use the parables. Why are you doing this, Jesus? Well, he answers in verse number 11. He says, and he answered, he answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Saying for you, yeah, I'm going to speak clearly with you guys. I'll give you explanation. I want you to understand things. That's appropriate for you to know these things. But for them, not for them. Again, I, I don't know how many Christians would be like, what do you mean? I mean, doesn't Jesus just want everybody to know about him and just know the truth? Let's keep reading. Verse number 12. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Well, that doesn't sound very fair. I thought Jesus was a communist. Just distribute everything all evenly. What do you mean take, take from the guy that has nothing or almost nothing and give it to the guy that has everything? That's what Jesus said. Get to know your Savior a little bit. Verse number 13, Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they, seeing, see not, and hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. But how is that going to get them to understand, Jesus? I mean, you're already saying they don't hear and they don't understand, so why are you speaking to them in a way where they're still not going to be able to understand? He says in uh, verse 14, And in them... And he says, and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. This is why. And this is what it boils down to is the prophecy of Isaiah, which we're going to turn there to. It's in Isaiah chapter 6. We're going to read this verse in verse 14 and 15. It says, and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, by hearing you shall hear and shall not understand. And seeing you shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. What he's saying is, if I didn't speak to them in parables and I just spake clearly, the naked understand they could they could they could see and hear and understand and be converted and say well isn't that what you want for them to happen isn't that the whole goal god's not willing that any should perish but all should come to repentance right yes but not for these people that are reprobate and when you you, you, you might not have quite gotten from the the quotation of isaiah but look at isaiah chapter 6 He's purposefully withholding so that they don't believe. He's making sure that the people who already have no forgiveness won't believe. Because, I mean, chapter 13 is right after chapter 12 when these people were still there saying, hey, you're doing this through Beelzebub. And they blaspheme the Holy Ghost. They've already blasphemed the Holy Ghost, so now Jesus is making sure, I'm going to make sure that you can't believe. So I'm only going to speak to you in parables now. I'm not going to be clear about it because you can't believe. And I'm going to make sure you don't believe, so I'm not going to tell you the truth the way you want to hear. Look at Isaiah chapter 6, verse number uh, 9. Or excuse me, verse number 8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. So here am I, Lord, send me. I want to do your bidding. I want to do your will. Tell me what to do. I'm ready to go. Give me the message. What is it that you want me to do? What is it that you want me to say? Verse number nine. And he said, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. He's saying, you've got ears, but you can't hear the truth, right? I know you can hear audibly, but you can't really hear. I know you got eyes. You're not, you're not blind physically, but you, you cannot see what I'm trying to show you. You guys are spiritually blind and deaf and dumb. He says, verse 10, and this is what he said, go and tell this people. Look, you've got, you've got eyes and you can't see. You've got ears and you can't hear. Verse 10, make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy. So this is a command. Make their eyes 
make the heart fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes. There's a command, shut their eyes. Yeah. Lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. He's saying, I don't want them to be converted and be healed, so shut their eyes. <coughs> This is the prophecy that's being fulfilled, that's being referenced in Matthew chapter 13 about why are you speaking to them in parables? Because I don't want them to be converted. Because it's too late for them. Because they blaspheme the Holy Ghost and they will never have forgiveness. It's a fact. And I, if I'm trying to teach this doctrine to people who are very hesitant, they don't like the doctrine, but they're a saved person, start with Matthew 12. Show them the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, which they should already know. I mean, people hear about this. People ask about this. Even just going out soul winning. And it's a good question to ask about. Like, well, if, say, you know, if, if it's only believing and you know, it's eternal life, then what about this? Right? It's a good question. Someone who's, who's actually thinking about things. But then it's, but it's not even just this. Then you could take them to the Mark of the Beast. Take them to the book of Revelation. Show them that, hey, everybody that takes the Mark of the Beast, they're going to hell. Show them Revelation 14. So it's the same exact thing. Is it, what if someone blasphemes the Holy Ghost? Can they believe in Jesus? No. What if someone takes the Mark of the Beast? Can they do it? No. <coughs> Everybody that takes the mark of the beast, they're damned. So whenever a person does that, they've sealed their fate. It's too late for them. You show them those, and then, and then while you're in Revelation, you could just go to Revelation 22 and show them what happens to people that corrupt the word of God, that add to and remove from God's word. They don't have forgiveness either. Those are three examples of people that has nothing to do with being a homo that three things that people can do and there is no forgiveness then if you can get someone to acknowledge yes this exists yes this is real yes this is possible then show them Romans 1 because now you can say Hey, doesn't this line up? God's given them over. God's hardened their heart. It's darkened. They can't believe. This is, this is an important doctrine. And it's an important one for you to understand as well because it is related to salvation. So, I'll, you know, I want to make sure that people are crystal clear on this because you don't want people thinking, just getting some, some heresies on salvation. Oh, well, you know, someone could lose their salvation or, or, you know, well, somehow trying to tie in works with salvation or whatever. If you don't understand these doctrines, it lines up perfectly with, with salvation being a free gift, but it just has to do with people who've rejected the gift. It doesn't change the gift. It doesn't change how you receive the gift. It changes nothing about salvation. What it does is just say, okay, here's a gift. And these are people who go, the Holy Ghost is of the devil. Well, you've just rejected the gift. Right. Hmm. Yeah, forever. That's right. It's gone. Yeah. Done. You ain't coming back again to offer the gift. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, no more. You've corrupted the Bible. Right. Oh. Sorry, you had to believe in the Word, not corrupt the Word. In Matthew chapter 12, because we're, we're, done, we're done with this, is um, in verse 33, the Bible said, Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. Notice, this is brought up right after he's talking about blaspheming the Holy Ghost. And I said in Matthew 7, we didn't really go into, uh, and you shall know them by their fruits. 
but, and we don't have time to go back through Matthew 7 tonight, but in Matthew chapter 7, it talks about the, um, the false prophet. It says, this is how you know the false prophet. You're going to know them by their fruits. Because the false prophet is, according to Jude, is someone who's twice dead. Already. They're alive physically on this earth, but it says, yeah, you, they're twice dead. They're trees whose fruit withereth. A tree whose fruit just, just is dead, dies, that's bad fruit. You don't want to eat dead, rotten fruit, right? That's going to make you sick. It's going to make you vomit. Bad fruit. The bad tree is bringing forth bad, rotten fruit. The book of Jude says the false prophet brings forth rotten fruit. They're twice dead. They have eternal death. We have eternal life. They have eternal death. And the bad tree is never going to bring forth good fruit, ever. And vice versa. The good tree will never bring forth a child of the devil. Never. And that's how you know a prophet are they a false prophet or a real prophet? And said, you know, don't let prophet confuse you. How about a preacher? How about a pastor? How about just a, a spiritual leader? Somebody who is a tree, someone who's bringing forth fruit, someone who's got people following him and is bringing, and, and is bringing converts, making converts. That's the best way to do it. Anyone's bringing forth converts, you want to know if that, con that person who's bringing forth converts is a good tree or a bad tree? Talk to the converts. That's the fruit inspection. It's not, it's not, let me into your house and let me go through all your stuff and let me search your internet history and I'm going to observe you and see if you're watching any movies or listening to any music. That's not the fruit inspection. The fruit inspection to know whether someone's a false prophet is what are your converts? What have you reproduced? Oh, they all think that you could lose your salvation. They all think that, that you know, they need to be good to go to heaven. False prophet. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. Verse 34, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? Generation of vipers. He's not talking to just your average unsaved person. He's talking to the snakes, the children of the devil. Satan's referenced as a, is, is symbolized by a serpent. And he's calling them vipers because they're children of the devil. Generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. That's why they're blaspheming the Holy Ghost. They're bringing forth just out of the evil of their heart. That's why they're conspiring to kill Jesus. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for um, all the great doctrines and truths of the Bible. Lord, I pray that you please just grant us wisdom and, and knowledge. Lord, help us to, to do that which is right. I pray that you would please just, uh, just grow our church, Lord, and be with the, with the preachers on Sunday and on Wednesday next week, dear God. I pray that you would please just, uh, just help them to expound your word and, and to teach the things that people here need to know. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.